Hi, thank you for joining. My name is Matt Miller. I'm a wealth counselor here at Burson Capital Management. We are a uh, wealth management firm, independent wealth management firm located in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, today, I'm, I'm excited. We have with us uh, our founder and chief investment officer, Tom Conley. As chief investment officer, Tom oversees the firm's investment decisions and uh, overall due diligence. Um, there's a lot of things we could talk about today in the market. I think we're going to, we're going to hone in on three things that seem to be pretty common on investors' minds, Tom. And one would be just, uh, the market highs, hitting market highs. Is this a bubble? You know, are, are we, are we overpriced? Just what's the overall sentiment of the market? The second would be interest rates and uh, third inflation. Um, so let's tackle all those things. Let's start with the first one. Uh, according to Google, uh, the S&P 500 has broken its record 68 times uh, in 2021. And as you know, it's a great opportunity for the press to jump on that and uh, create chaos and, and fear in investors. How, wh what is the overall sentiment of the market, Tom? How do you feel about it? Um, are we overpriced? And how do investors interpret that message that we're hitting these highs constantly? It seems like it's a good thing. Oh, it is. It's uh, that's a kind of a two part question. So I'll handle the highs first. So it, it's not unusual uh, for a market that has a underlying positive drift uh, to hit new highs. So what I mean by a positive drift is um, the, the way we make money in the stock market in the long run is the market pays us income in the form of dividends. And those dividends grow because corporate earnings grow uh, over time. So uh, if that happens, uh, on average, that, that's positive year by year, then we would expect uh, uh, the market to go up year by year to reflect those increased dividends. So the fact that the market hits new records at any point in time or any, any given year is not a concern in and of itself. The second part of your question, though, <clears throat> um, is really asking, have the prices we're paying in the market kind of outrun those fundamentals of earnings and dividends. Are we, uh, the price is going up too fast and are we paying maybe too much for current dividends and future dividend growth? And I would say uh, that's kind of a mixed picture. Uh, in the U.S., there are certain parts of the market that are certainly speculative um, and uh, that, that you've probably read about, uh, technology uh, being one of them. Um, crypto assets being another. Um, the rest of the stock market is not necessarily as expensive. And then if you go outside of the U.S., um, markets are pretty much around their long-term average in terms of what you're paying for a dollar of corporate earnings. And so we're not at all concerned about markets outside the U.S. at this time. But there are some places in the U.S. market where we're we're a little bit worried, and uh, at the end, we'll we'll kind of tell you what we've done about that in our uh, with our client uh, portfolios. Great. Um, we could probably have a whole session on this next topic: inflation, unexpected inflation. Uh, what are your thoughts on what's going on in the market and what we can expect uh, to see in the future, Tom? Well, the inflation story: uh, inflation is simply, you know, prices going up. Um, on what we pay for goods and services. And that can be caused by a number of different things. There are really three broad ways to think about inflation. One is uh, demand, where you have more people want goods and services than they are available. So you know, if you took basic economics, if there are more people want things, the price will go up. There's another way that the supply of goods and services that people want um, are constricted. And so if the supply is constricted and people still want the goods and services, then the prices will go up there. Now, as a result of COVID, um, we've experienced both. We've had uh, a, a supply constricted uh, in the U.S., things like early retirements, things like supply chain problems abroad, ports getting clogged on the West Coast, and uh, you know the big surge of demand after COVID. Um, and then in the demand category, we've had um, uh, fiscal stimulus. Uh, the government's given out money to people as a result of the 
um, to mitigate the COVID pandemic. And that resulted, uh, that went right into the pockets of consumers. And that resulted in a huge burst of consumption of uh, not only services, but goods. Uh, people couldn't use services uh, during COVID because their contact was restricted. So they bought stuff. And so that uh, we've had both demand and supply elements hit at the same time. Uh, and the third one is is uh, money supply. If you have an economy and you create more money or currency than there is growth in the underlying economy, then you get too many uh, dollars chasing too few goods. And when you look at the stimulus uh, in terms of the money Congress is authorized to spend and the presidents have signed, um, and then the, the monetary stimulus that the Federal Reserve has created uh, money to buy back its own bonds and to provide financing for this spending. We're at levels last seen uh, world, around World War II, and the stimulus we've seen thus far is way beyond uh, the GFC. It's uh, probably three-plus times the stimulus that was provided uh, in 2007. GFC is I'm sorry, the great... A great financial crisis in 2007 uh, through 2009. So they they really came at this hard. And so when you have uh, the perception or you have the reality of a lot of uh, money creation and a lot of additional spending, um, people are looking at that and saying, well, what happens during the next crisis? You know, are we going to do this again and, and spend um, a lot of resources, um, uh, that we you know, we have to borrow money uh, from future generations, and that that will create money. And that's not just a U.S. phenomenon. Uh, globally, uh, there's been a, a massive amount of, of stimulus uh, in terms of monetary and fiscal spending as well. So it's not just solely a dollar phenomenon. But that's really uh, the, the supply and demand issues are short to medium term. The the monetary and fiscal issues to me are much longer term and much more concerning. Can you t touch on that a little bit? What do you mean by that, Tom? Well, we, we've gotten used to uh, intervening in the economy when markets go down or the economy goes down or looks like it's going to go down. Um, and that's been going on since, really since the early 90s in, in various uh, degrees. So when you've borrowed um, 130% of, the, of your size of your economy and your deficits are, um, you know, between five and 10% a year, and then you're saying, well, the next time we have a recession, are we going to intervene and spend even more money? Or if the market goes down more than 10%, does the Federal Reserve start buying bonds again? You know, people look at that and they say, well, the bias in the system is to create all the, this money, um, and that's inflationary. You know, yeah. we, we don't have a mindset like we did after World War II when we ran up the debt and spent all the money last time. That, well, when the war's done, Bread's, you know, bread stop. and butter, right? Yeah, we're going to stop borrowing and we're going to grow the economy uh, so that the debt is reduced. I mean, you just don't even hear about people talking like that today. So that's why it's much more concerning over the long run uh, to me. And one of the reasons we're taking actions uh, in our investment strategy. Well, and we'll touch on that in a minute, but speaking of monetary policy, one of the, you know, first things often that, that the Fed will do and with the fear of inflation is raise short-term rates. Uh, we've been talking about rates possibly going up for a long time. Um, are rising rates uh, a concern? Uh, and what do you see happening in the near future? Well, if you, um, I saw a piece about uh, the, the forecast from the survey of professional forecasters from the Philadelphia Fed that goes back 20 years. And each year they ask this group of people to forecast 10 year rates for the next 10 years. And if you look, they're almost always up every year for the last 20 years. And they've almost always been wrong. Um, and so we've been forecasting higher rates for years and years and years and rates keep going down. So I'm not going to say my forecast is better than anybody else's. It's probably sure. probably not. But you, when you're in a situation where your your 
interest rates, um, and I'm going to talk about treasury bonds here because everything else is kind of anchored off of those. Your, your treasury bond rates are lower than what people think inflation is going to be. That's really an untenable situation. So, you know, the 10-year forecasted rate of inflation right now is about 2.6%. And, you know, you can make a you know, percent and a half, give or take a, a, a little on a 10-year treasury bond. So, you know, the interest you earn back doesn't even cover inflation. Well, sure. an economy can't work like that forever. You need, you know, an investor needs to earn back inflation plus uh, a premium on top of that. And so, um, and when you get negative real rates, like that's what happens, negative real rates are when the, the uh, rate you're earning on your bonds is lower than the inflation rate, uh, expected inflation rate. Um, it, 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 it makes for a lot of uh, suboptimal behavior out in the economy, a lot of projects get funded that shouldn't be funded, investments right. made that shouldn't be made, speculative bubbles in parts of the market. And so um, as the economy uh, continues to be strong and in the rest of the world perks up as well, uh, you'd expect uh, rates to go up. Um, and, you know, in the first part of this year, the few, first few days, we're, we're seeing that in a big way. Uh, rates have spiked up quite a bit here in the first few days of January. So, um we are looking at that as a possibility and also uh, the types of investments that affects uh, are, you know, bonds where you've committed for a long period of time, long uh, number of years of maturity. Um, it could be stocks, growth stocks where you're depending on earnings way out in the future, like in technology stocks, as opposed to earnings that I might get right away, which would be an example, that might be a utility or an oil company. Um, right. Those will get hit harder by high inflation. So, uh, but yeah, the expectation is as the economy normalizes for not only interest rates to go up, but the Federal Reserve to, to stop or even reverse its program of buying bonds back as well. Right. Yep. Yeah. And it's a, it's an interesting time with all these, there's a lot of things going on uh, when you factor in market highs, inflation, and uh, where interest rates are. What What's Versant doing uh, in their portfolios to, to deal with some of these? And I know that's a loaded question that could probably have an hour long answer, but uh, what are some of the things we're doing uh, in, in reaction or to mitigate some of those, those risks or potential possibilities? Well, I'll just go over some of the high points real quick. Um, so in the in the fixed income realm, you know, where we're basically functioning, uh, the parts of the portfolio we're actually functioning as lenders, lending money out to borrowers. Um, the commitments on the bonds are relatively short term, so they're not as sensitive to interest rates. Uh, we also have um, some shorter dated strategies. Uh, in the uh, uh, alternative uh, market area that pay a higher rate in return for some credit risk, but are very uh, much less interest rate sensitive. So the traditional portfolio where we might have 20 or 30 year treasury bonds or municipal bonds is not something we're doing right now, because if interest rates were to go up and go up sharply, those investments would be hurt, uh, hit pretty hard. And so um, we, we also have a separate pie slice uh, in our portfolios called inflation hedges. And over the last couple of years, that's gone up to be, you know, between 10 and 15% of a portfolio, which is quite a side bet or, or, or a hedge is, is what I prefer to think of it as against inflation being higher than expectations. So right now, the treasury market, the difference between treasury inflation protected securities and regular treasury bonds is telling us that the market expects inflation to average 2.6% a year over the next 10 years or thereabouts. Uh, I, I'll i take that, but I, I don't think for a minute inflation is going to be that low. So we, we have um, that slice carved out, and it's devoted to investments that historically are sensitive to unexpected inflation. So that would be uh, things like um, metals or agriculture or water or oil, energy, energy. Um, gold is another one. 
that we have a little bit of. So those types of things that when we, like in the 70s, when we uh, six, late 60s and 70s, when inflation went up unexpectedly, uh, they gave a little boost uh, to the portfolio because other assets that frankly would have done well over the last 40 years when interest rates have been coming down consistently, um, real favorable environment, that we, we, we may not repeat that experience um, going forward to the next 40 years. So the third thing we've done, which addresses both areas, interest rate sensitivity and unexpected inflation. And then also the first question you asked valuations is our portfolios are tilted out, outside the US right now. I mentioned some of the US, United States equities we think are, are expensive. Uh, in fact, by a lot of valuation metrics, they're in the top five percentile of, of his, in history in valuation. So we've till, we, we are emphasizing outside the US, number one. Uh, number two, um, we are tilting toward what are called value stocks and value stocks are simply uh, stocks that have uh, valuation metrics that are lower. They typically don't grow earnings as fast as growth stocks, but they tend to be those types of stocks that are less sensitive to rising interest rates, number one. And number two, the valuations are much lower uh, on a historical basis versus growth stocks. Um, so we don't, not only are those good defensive tilts in our view, but but they've been under uh, underpriced for so long versus growth. We think they're a good investment opportunity as right. well uh, going forward. So that tilt to value to smaller companies outside the U.S., um, are uh, are things we've done as uh, as well to reduce um, inflation and interest rate and valuation concerns in our client portfolios. That's great. Well, um, Tom, you want to take us out? Um... Yes, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming on board and watching today. I know your time's valuable, especially at the start of a new year when. We're shaking off the holiday fun and trying to get back to work. Um, we're going to have some upcoming videos on other topics uh, for you. I'd let, please keep your eye out for those. There are going to be things like uh, uh, focus on the housing market, uh, cognitive biases and in investing, um, hidden risk and in fixed income, and some other pieces uh, on estate planning and, and investment philosophy in general. And so you can find additional information on these issues, on these upcoming events on our website, um, or we'll, in addition to the notices we'll be sending out uh, via email and, and uh, or your, uh, uh, your team uh, can keep you up to date on these events. So uh, thank you so much for spending so much of your valuable time with us and look forward to seeing you for the next time. Thank you, Tom.